And please turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And in a few moments we will read this entire chapter. Matthew 10 verses 1 through 42. I know that that's a long scripture reading. Uh, but this is a sermon of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles, when they originally heard it, heard it at one sitting. And I think there's great benefit for us to read the entire uh, sermon at once before we go back through in the weeks to come and to treat each, uh, each section individually. Matthew chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 1 after we pray. Let us pray. Father, what a passage of scripture that is uh, before us this morning, and, and we are so thankful that we do not have to wonder about the sermons of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he preached and what topics that he covered because it's recorded for us in the pages of scripture. I pray that you would give us uh, humble and submissive minds and that you would deliver from us self-righteousness and high-mindedness and the tendency we have to establish a religion that is foreign to the religion of the New Testament. Oh, Father, give us meekness, uh, give us tenderness of heart and tenderness of soul uh, to in these moments realize that as I read the scripture in a few moments, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is speaking to us individually as people and he's speaking to us corporately as a congregation. He is seeking to show us what it means to be a disciple in this fallen world with all of its difficulty, with all of its hostility, with all of its opposition to the message of the gospel. Lord, help us in these moments hear the Lord Jesus Christ through his spirit, through this section of the word of God, and we pray in his name. Amen. Verse 1 of Matthew 10 and he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men. For they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother who will deliver brother over to death and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, 
how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim it on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we began our studies in Matthew last fall, and initially, you'll remember, we looked at the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the primary missions of Matthew, obviously, in this gospel is to make disciples, true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the basic command that we saw last fall is this command, follow me, and I think I preached 16 sermons on this very command that's found throughout Matthew's gospel. Next of all, we looked at the mysteries of Matthew, and we began that study on Wednesday nights last fall. We studied the parables uh, that are found in Matthew's gospel, and we concluded these studies in early 2018. And the parables are teaching tools that the Lord Jesus uses to teach many, many lessons about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Now, when we finish these parables on uh, uh, on our Wednesday night studies earlier this year, we considered the miracles of Matthew. And we closed out our Wednesday night studies uh, this year looking at the miracles that are found in Matthew's gospel. Uh, these miracles validate Christ's messianic claims. He fulfills the Old Testament predictions concerning the Messiah, and the miracles testify to this. And the miracles also highlight the great compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ on the hurting multitudes of his day. Well, finally, we began our study in Matthew uh, several months ago on the messages of Matthew. We said that you can go through Matthew's gospel and see numerous sermons that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. We finished up our studies in the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most famous of Christ's sermons that are found in the gospel, maybe the most famous sermon ever preached in the history of the church. Uh, we spent, I think, about um, five or six weeks or, um, uh, well, more than that, several months. Was, I think it's about eight, eight weeks maybe. But, but my, my point is, is there have been ministers that have preached through the Sermon on the Mount for years. Uh, we treated it in a very cursory way. There was much more we could have said about the Sermon on the Mount, but we completed that uh, back in June. And now we come to this sermon in Matthew 10, which is the sermon... Uh, to the apostles, we will spend the next five weeks covering these stunning words that I just read in their entirety in Matthew chapter 10. Now our study today is just a brief introduction and it has to do with the 12 apostles. They are named for us in verses 1 through 4. 
And let us note, first of all today, the number of the apostles. You see that in verse 1. He called to him his twelve disciples. And then down in verse 2, the names of the twelve apostles are these. And he gives us a list of these individuals. Now Matthew pulls a little switcheroo on us in these verses. First of all, in verse 1, he designates them as his disciples. And then in verse 2, he calls them his apostles. Now, is this significant? I think that it is. Uh, The word here for disciple is the more general term. Every true Christian is a disciple or should be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not following the Lord Jesus Christ, then it calls into question whether he's really your master, whether he's really your Lord. In Luke's gospel, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? I mean, you can profess with your lips all day long that you're Christ, but the proof of the pudding is in the way we live and the way we behave. And do we stick our nose in the pages of the New Testament and determine from Scripture how we are to behave and what we are to believe in light of what we profess with our lips? So every Christian is a disciple, but the term apostle is specific and it is unique. It has to do with the official status of these 12 men in the first century church. The word for apostle means to send and to send in an official sense. And you see the Lord Jesus Christ doing this here with these apostles. He called to him his 12 disciples. They were already marked out. And he gives them and them alone authority over demons to cast them out. And to heal, notice what it says, every disease and every affliction. Now this office of apostle was a unique office. It's unrepeatable. You might be driving down the street uh, sometimes through a city or something and you will see the name of a church and down below it it will say, Apostle so-and-so. Well, those people are just misinformed. There are no apostles now in the New Testament church. After these 12 men died, the apostolic office was done. It was over. It was through. Uh, Notice these men had the authority not to just cast out one or two diseases, but every disease and every affliction. It was this special power granted them by the Lord Jesus Christ to prove their authority and to prove their special position in the New Testament church. So out of this broad disciple pool in the first century, Christ identifies 12 for the apostolic office. Now I want to do just a little application at this point, and it's this. Being a disciple is the first requirement for office in the church of Christ. Nominees for office, in our context, ruling elders and deacons and teaching elders, should always be asked about their knowledge of Christ and their walk with Him. How can officers of the Christian church lead the Christian church if they do not know the head and king of that church, namely the Lord Jesus Christ? And you see proof of this even in the passage that Christ was choosing and ordaining people to office and who got in? Judas Iscariot. If it happened under the ministry of Christ, you can bet it can happen in our context as well. So one very clear point of application here is that officers of the church are to be true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are to be asked about their relationship to Him. Do they know Him in truth? And are they walking with Him? That is the first requirement. For one thing, it's a requirement for membership in the church, but it's raised to the higher level when it comes to our officers concerning our ministers and our ruling elders and our deacons. The great Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, The best preparative for the work of ministry is an acquaintance and communion with Jesus Christ. Well, back to this point of the twelve. Why in the world did he choose twelve and not thirteen or twenty or fifty? Why did he choose twelve? Well, some say that in the Bible, twelve is the number for perfection or the number for completeness. Personally, I believe that this harkens back to Old Testament Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel. 
One person has explained it like this. Jesus' selection of 12 disciples is intentional and patterned on the 12 tribes of Israel. Just as God once formed His people from the 12 sons of Jacob, so too does Christ form a new people starting with the 12 apostles. So the first simple lesson here concerning the number of the apostles is that the Old Testament church was founded on the Messianic promise and the 12 patriarchs, the sons of of Jacob. The New Testament church was founded on Christ himself and the 12 apostles. So we see something here about the number of the apostles. But notice secondly the names of the apostles. And you see that this forms the bulk of our passage today. Matthew just simply goes through and names these 12 apostles. And what I want us to do here, I want us to notice the big picture first, then we're going to go and look at these apostles as individuals. And in the big picture, notice the order of the names. You see Simon, that is Peter, James, and John. They are mentioned first. These individuals are mentioned first for a reason, because they were Christ's inner circle. They were the leaders among the leaders. Whenever you have a leadership body, there's always going to be certain people within that leadership body that rise to the top. And we see this happening here with the original 12. You see Andrew mentioned right after Peter. He is inserted here because he is Peter's brother. But notice next in the list, you see the priority of Peter. It says first, Simon, who is called Peter. Peter, and he is mentioned first of the first because he became the spokesman for this original band of leaders in the apostolic church. And you'll remember his tremendous confession in Matthew 16 when Christ said, Who do the people say that I am? And Peter was the one who stepped up and said, You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. You'll also notice brief commentary after eight of these apostles. Simon, who is called Peter, we have the reminder here of his his, his life uh, before uh, conversion. We see Andrew, Peter's brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Matthew the tax collector, who by the way is authoring this gospel, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and then Judas Iscariot at the end, the one who betrayed him. So when you look at this big picture of the apostles, we learn something of the dynamics of the group. There is order, there is priority, there are leaders amongst the leaders. You see the family connections within the apostles, there are brothers. You learn something about some occupations, there are fishermen and there are tax collectors. We were left in the dark concerning the occupation of many of them. We recall key New Testament events, Peter and his confession, Judas and his betrayal, and then other apostles are listed here that we know little about. Let's go to the individuals and look at them uh, very briefly this morning. Notice, first of all, there is Peter. It's a little wonder that Peter is mentioned first because he is a major player in the pages of the New Testament. You notice his prominence in the Gospels and in Acts. There are two letters in the New Testament that bear Peter's name, 1st and 2nd Peter, and most New Testament scholars believe that Mark's gospel is actually Peter's gospel as well, that Peter was the one that dictated to Mark, and Mark wrote this down. We know that Peter served the church in Jerusalem and Palestine after Christ's ascension, and that Peter eventually suffered martyrdom, and martyrdom by crucifixion. You've probably heard the story that when he was taken to be executed, uh, he requested to be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to be crucified like his Lord was crucified. So Peter, a major player in this group of early apostles. Notice Peter's brother, Andrew. And what do we remember about Andrew? Well, Andrew was the soul winner. Andrew was the one that heard about the Lord Jesus Christ and brought Peter to him. Now, there's not a whole lot that is said in the pages of the New Testament about Andrew except some of these things like this, but almost every time that Andrew is mentioned, he is seen in that role behind the scenes, 
going to family, going to friends, taking people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a lesson that is for us. You may never preach a sermon. And you may never stand up in a public way to confess your faith. But if you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are responsible to share that faith. And God can use you in a tremendous way like he used Andrew. Scholars debate the location of Andrew's ministry after Christ's ascension, but there's one individual that records this, that he went to Greece, and while he was in Greece, the governor of Greece ordered him to worship the pagan gods, and when he did not do it, Andrew was scourged, he was crucified, and then to make his death more lingering, he was fastened to the cross, not with nails, but with cords, with straps. And having hung on that cross for two days, praising God the whole time, he gave his life up as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. A little over a week ago, Lynn, Charlie, Kate, and I were at St. Andrew's Cathedral, or St. Andrew's Town in Scotland. And legend has it, now it's legend, it's not necessarily truth, that his bones were taken as relics and were left there in the cathedral uh, in St. Andrews. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know, but the town of St. Andrews is named after Andrew right here. Note third, James. And we are told here that he was a son of Zebedee. And as you saw from Wayne's reading earlier in Mark, he was known as one of the sons of thunder. Don't you like that? There was a place for all kind of preachers, but you know, wimpy preachers just don't go across very well, do they? I mean, if you got a message of authority to say and to preach, stand up and say it with power. It's kind of like this term here for James and John, they were known as sons of thunder. It speaks of their energy and their boldness as apostles. And you may remember where his boldness got him. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. His martyrdom is recorded in Acts chapter 12. Herod had him slain with a sword. Notice the fourth apostle that is mentioned here, John, the, the brother of of James, another son of thunder. Uh, he has the distinction of being the only apostle who did not suffer martyrdom. Now when you study all these apostles and seek this issue of martyrdom, there's some question marks on some of them, but we do know from the New Testament that John himself died on the Isle of Patmos in exile where he received the revelation as an old man. And again, he's a major player on the pages of the New Testament. He's a member of Christ's inner circle. He was a definite New Testament heavyweight. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the book of Revelation or received the revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote three New Testament letters, a major player on the pages of the New Testament. Notice Philip. Uh, his life is recorded in numerous places in the Gospels and in Acts. And tradition is a little uncertain here, but in all likelihood... He faced martyrdom in Asia. Do you notice that refrain? Martyrdom, martyrdom, martyrdom. Mar it sounds like Matthew 10 came true, doesn't it? I send you out, Christ says, as sheep amidst the wolves. Now when you get to the rest of the apostles that begin with Bartholomew, it is really kind of hard to get information. I went to various New Testament or Bible dictionaries trying to get information and when you deal with the first five, there's quite a bit of information in those dictionaries about these apostles. But when you get to the last ones on the list, it's hard to find a lot of information about them. And some of them, this is the only place that we see them in the pages of the New Testament. Tradition has it that Bartholomew preached the gospel in India and was flayed alive and then crucified with his head downward. Thomas, remember Thomas? What do we primarily remember Thomas for? We remember him for his doubts. But let's remember him for his death. Legend has it that he was killed with a sword or killed with a lance. Matthew says little about himself in the gospel, but legend has it that he took the Great Commission seriously. Remember some of the last words that he wrote were, 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Legend has it that Matthew did just that. He went to the nations of that time with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't know much about his death. James, the son of Alphaeus, little is known about him. Thaddeus, little is known about him. Simon the Zealot, little is known about him. And then finally, Judas Iscariot. And we know the sordid tale. He went down in history as the one who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. So do you notice that refrain? Would you have answered the call? Martyrdom, crucifixion awaited them in their service to Christ. Sure doesn't sound like your best life now. It sounds a whole lot like the verse we will see, as I mentioned a moment ago, verse 16. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. After two days of sending you pictures from Scotland, I ran it across my secretary. Hey, is this okay to keep sending these pictures? She said, yeah, keep sending them, so I can blame it on her for all the pictures you got. But did you notice about Patrick Hamilton in the 1500s in Scotland? He went to the mainland, studied under Martin Luther, learned the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and at 24 years of age, he goes back to St. Andrew to the university and begins to preach those doctrines. And at 24 years old, he was burned at the stake for preaching the gospel. You know why we're so quiet about it? Because we know the hostility of our culture. And we know that if we speak up like these apostles did, it's not always going to be good. But nonetheless, that is the call to the New Testament church to sound forth this message to every creature. I remembered a number of years ago when I was an early Christian, I was trying to memorize the names of the apostles that I came across a, a song of all people, the Statler Brothers, called the Brave Apostles 12. Any of you ever heard that song before? You don't want me to sing it to you. Uh, but it goes like this. Andrew, go and tell your brother Peter. Come and run it. Tell him the one he's waiting for is waiting for him. The two he calls the sons of thunder quit their jobs this morning. And for eternal revenue, Matthew is cashing in. Philip, tell Bartholomew there's something good from Nazareth. They've never met, but Jesus seems to know him through and through. And Thomas, he'll go with you, don't you doubt it, for a minute. James the less and Judas and the zealot Simon too. Traveling around from town to town preaching, it gets expensive, so they took along some women who took along some wealth. And the twelfth one was chosen to be their trusted treasurer. Would you believe Judas Iscariot himself? And here's the kicker. Next Sunday morning, when your mind starts to wonder, and that pulpit prayer gets long, and you start thinking about yourself, ask in your heart if you would part with family, friends, and your money. And leave it all for Jesus, like the brave apostles dwell. I like that song. Now there's one thing about that song I don't like. The title. Do you honestly think after listening to this sermon, like I read to you just a few moments ago, that they were courageous and they were brave? Folks, they were shaking in their boots. Just like you and I shake in our boots when we think about the cost that it would take in our day and time to stand up for this gospel. 
See, the fact of the matter in the story is not the braveness and the courage of the Apostles 12, but the greatness of their Savior and the greatness of their God. That they came to Him in all their weakness. They came to Him with all of their fears. And it was by His grace that they were made strong. And if a song can be written, Brave Apostles 12, it can only be written because of the strength and the power that Christ will give to His people. When they turn from themselves, when they place their anxieties into, their hand, into His hands, and say, Christ, use me in this day and time for your glory, not to spread morality, but to spread this gospel and to get it out there to a culture that is in darkness and in despair and quite frankly, dear friend, is going to hell without this message. Let us pray.